My name is Peter Fonestock and I'm a resource soil scientist with the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I'm going to make a brief video just to show you how to use the cropland in-field soil health assessment guide. So this, this particular assessment is designed to be used, I'm reading this obviously, as a diagnostic tool to help mostly conservation planners, but it could be used by anybody who wants to sort of monitor the soil health in their fields. But it's typically designed for conservation planners to determine and document if there are any soil health concerns on any field that we may be wishing to do a plan on. So it's not really a monitoring tool. You can use the soil health kit to do the monitoring part. But with a little bit of adaptation, you could probably come back and use some components of this to sort of generally see how your soil uh, or your soil health is improving or, or hopefully improving or not improving over a period of time. So there's 11 indicators and we don't necessarily recommend that you use all 11 or that depending on the season that you're actually going out to the field that you actually even would use all 11 indicators. We're going to actually evaluate all 11 of those indicators just to show you how you do this in field assessment in the field. But um, depending also on where you are in the, in the country or where you are in the state, we're actually in Southern California, we're in the desert part of Southern California, so some of the indicators are going to be less reliable uh, or less uh, useful, I should say, uh, than some of the other ones. But we'll go through it and just demonstrate how to go, th how to do each one of those, each one of those indicators. So let's go ahead and go out to the field. Here's an actual close-up of what that sheet looks like. And you can see here that we've got set all the indicators listed here. We've got soil cover, residue break breakdown, surface crust, ponding, penetration resistance, water stable aggregates, soil structure, soil color, plant roots, biological diversity, and hopefully we'll find some biopores as well. Hi, we're here in the field doing the in-field soil health assessment guide. We're going to be looking at some of the different some of the different indicator descriptions and how to actually do them. And the first one we're going to look at is soil cover. So we all kind of know that a significant factor in promoting soil health is having your soil covered. Now, so the, the soil could be covered by any number of things. And what you see here is an example of soil being covered by plastic. This is a, a nice cover crop here in this orchard. It's some inter intercropping going on. You can see they've got some plastic mulch down here to, to grow these green onions. Um, you can also see over here to, to the other side, you can see a dry patch of, of, uh, of cover that's actually a cover crop that, that has been allowed to, allowed to grow and then die. And that's actually, that's actually leeks, if, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, leeks or chives, I believe. And a somewhat unusual um, cover crop, but nevertheless, it's, 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 very, it's very functional. So how we're going to assess our soil cover is really, really this is a visual assessment. So what we'll do is we'll just go to some different areas and we'll just point out what the percentage of cover actually is. There's, there's, there's good times to do this and this may not be the best of times, but the principles behind doing and or estimating soil cover are going to be the same no matter what time of year that we actually do that. So here we have uh, the 100% the cover. This is a cover crop, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that's been allowed to, uh, to die. And it's obviously you don't see any any bare soil surface whatsoever. This is this is beautiful. Nothing is gonna all the effectiveness of a of a, a surface cover is gonna be evidenced or gonna be gained by having this this here. Now let's walk over here a little bit and look underneath this orchard tree. You can see that we've got a fair amount of residue here, and it, it's it's probably gonna vary a little bit. The wind has actually moved some of this around, but it looks to me like we've probably got about anywhere from maybe a low of. 15 to 20 percent to maybe a maximum of about 50 percent cover on this one. So this again very representative in, a, in an orchard you would probably have leaves and maybe some of the twigs that might have been cuttings off of that and, and, and maybe some of the some of the weeds that have grown also would sort of act as a, as a, as a cover on, on, in this case. Now this we're going to move over to some to some onions and, and look at a system that's a little bit more agricultural rather than orchard based. So here we have a little bit more of a, a horticultural or a vegetable situation where you might be looking at, at assessing your soil cover. And you can see here that we've got some green onions. These are these are maybe larger green onions than you might be used to seeing. These are actually a Korean version. But um, you can see that there's a varying amounts of cover here. So let's come in and focus in on, on this cover where the crop's actually been removed. 
And this this might be typical of what you'd find in in a, in a field where you're growing different kinds of vegetables. I would say that we're looking at this. We're probably looking right about 40% cover. So there's there's guides that will show you this. And as a matter of fact, the uh, the soil health uh, assessment guide has pictures in it that gives you ideas of what those different amounts of residue or cover would actually look like. So that it's, it's really quite easy for anybody to use that guide and to be able to estimate what your cover is at any given time. So we're going to use the same the same field here that we just looked at for soil cover and um, we're going to actually talk about soil residue or residue breakdown. I'm going to read what read what comes out of the the soil field health assessment guide. And so it says residue breakdown is the actually is the biological shredding, fragmenting, cycling, or decomposition of previous crop residue. Now, I will say that that if it's not crop residue, it could actually be it could actually be added mulch, like what, what like what we're going to be looking at here. This mulch on this particular site was added about five years ago, and it's I think it's four or five inches thick. So we're going to have a look and see what it looks like as we dig down through that, and we'll do that live on video. Now it. it, it should be we, we should actually mention that we're in Southern California we're actually in the desert so our conditions and and the conditions of breakdown our residue decomposition are going to be very much dependent on not only the irrigation schedule which for these trees I think is about every three days but it's also going to be dependent upon the climate so we don't really know right where we're going to dig how much decomposition is actually ha is actually gonna will have occurred or how that will be varied around these trees since all of these trees are irrigated and they don't get any moisture whatsoever other other than the irrigation so any residue decomposition or breakdown is going to be dependent upon how much water these trees actually get from the irrigation so let's just go ahead and have it and have a look and just see what we can find so here you can see this is looks like pretty good pretty good uh, compost or, or mulch not compost but but mulch that's here in the ground and as we've gone down about an inch now and it looks like we're, we're still it's still quite recognizable as um, as uh, woody materials. We can see twigs and and bark, and I'm not sure if this is if this is any fungal material there, or if that's just maybe some synthetics. I'm going to guess that's actually something synthetic that might have came with the residue. So let's ignore that. So now we're we've we've come down quite a ways on this, and we're actually near the near the surface of the soil. So you can actually see that. In this case here, this is actually a really good example of how if you don't actually keep these things moist, that your, soil, your, your residue may not really break down, especially and in particular if it's, if it's a woody material. And this, this is a woody mulch. I think this is probably was, was yard waste that, um, that was brought here. And it looks to me like even though we're, we're about four or five inches down, you can see here's the soil surface right below us. You can, the, the material right above that still looks pretty much like it probably did five years ago. There's not much, not much breakdown through here. So in this case, um, it, would be a, it would be a pretty good assessment. It'd be pretty easy to determine that if we really wanted that to break down and be incorporated into the soil, that in this case, we're really not getting that. This mulch was probably put right on top of the soil surface and wasn't incorporated. And they probably hoped that there would be incorporation by microbes and, and insects and whatnot. But it doesn't look like in this case that there's enough m water this far out from, the, from uh, the, the tree base for that actually to happen. So just, uh, just something interesting to see here. And that, and that might be something we would expect in this environment that might be totally different in another environment. Well, health indicators that we're looking at here are the combination of, of crusting and ponding. Uh, you can kind of see that the soil here has sort of puddled. It looks like water has been sitting on this for quite some time. The puddling might be an indication that we've got some salts in the soil as well that sort of dispersed it. That would also lead to the, if, if the dispersal was, was a problem, that would cause the, the water, any water to be standing on this soil, to just sit on the soil until it, it actually evaporates. Uh, if, if it wasn't a salt issue, when we, and we see this kind of uh, ponding going on, the, the thing that you might think of is where are we on the field? Are we in a wheel rut? This almost looks like it could be a wheel rut. It's a little bit of a depression. If that was the case, it might not be a salt issue. It might actually be a compaction issue and that we might have the, 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 the soil underneath is so compacted that the water is just unable to penetrate through the surface and actually penetrate that compacted layer. 
Okay, so in this particular assessment, what we're going to look at is ponding and infiltration. Now, I will tell you right off the bat that we're not going to have any ponding issues here. We'll try to look for another spot that will definitely have that. But you would, if you were interested in, in, in doing this assessment in a field, the best time to actually do it would be after either a rainfall event or after irrigation has just, been, has just come through. And then you just walk around the field and you would look for areas that are holding water. And that, that would be an indication that you've got something going on below the surface. It could, it could be compaction. It could be uh, an impermeable layer of some sort, which is also compaction. But it could be a natural layer, like, say, a durapan or what some people call caliche. Uh, it could indicate uh, a, a maybe a heavy clay layer. There's, there's any number of things that, that could be causing the compaction or causing the, the standing water. But um, since most soils, even, even in poor shape will eventually pass water through them it would be best to make sure that you do this at a time that you know the situation will be worse which again as I said would be after a rainfall event or an irrigation event so in this case just for, so we can demonstrate what infiltration looks like uh, we've we've got it set up here with just a, just a standard soil health six inch ring uh, some of you may have already used these we've got some some um, cling wrap here with with a with a, an exact amount of water on it what we're going to do here in a second is we're just going to go ahead and pull this pull this away pull the cling wrap away and let the water infiltrate into the soil and what we would actually do is we would we would uh, assess how quickly the water actually moves through the soil and you'd want it to move fairly quickly through the soil for there to, for it to indicate that there was no problems so one of the things that we should make we, sh we should note here is that when you have these rings or when you do any kind of an assessment that has water moving into the soil this is the simplest method there are other ways to do it but you really need to make sure that you push the ring into the soil or pound it into the soil very carefully you don't want it to be wiggling back and forth and you might actually if you find that you're doing a little wiggling make sure that the soil surface inside is kind of sealed by pushing it down with your fingers so that you don't have any water moving down through the sides of your ring into the soil and, and giving you a, a, a false assessment so here we go without me talking anymore let's pull this water this cling wrap away and let's just see what happens Please. So it's, it's, it's been moved away. You can see we have a nice surface uh, of, of cover. And looking down on this, you can see that it, it looks like it's moving down very, very nicely into the soil. I don't see any, any uh, bubbling or anything like that, which you probably wouldn't really expect with that much residue cover. But it's, it's moving down uh, quite rapidly. It, it, looks, it looks good. We've, we've had about 20 seconds go by now. And we can probably video this just another few seconds and all the water that we put on there and that was uh that was how much water was that 500 milliliters so a half a liter a half a liter of water in say 30 seconds or so went into this soil so that's that's pretty good infiltration i wouldn't expect there to be any problems here at all with that and ideally you'd want to repeat this on similar areas throughout the field to make sure that you didn't hit uh, an odd spot, say like a, you just over a gopher hole or something like that. For this soil assessment, what we're going to do is we're going to look at penetration resistance. And you can see I'm going to use a wire flag here, which is pretty easy for anybody to get a hold of. If you have a penetrometer or a soil compaction meter, that'll work. That'll work as well. But but they they can be finicky, as we've just discovered with the with the, with the one that we had. Um, the one important thing that people often forget to do on this is that you need to assess this when the soil is at or near field capacity. As the soils dry out, they're going to get much harder and penetration resistance is going to be much more difficult to really assess accurately. So you really want to do this when the soils are pretty darn wet. So what we've done here is this is the area where we actually did the infiltration test and we're going to show you the difference between that wet soil and the penetration resistance and right next to it where we have a dry soil. So here we just use it, we're just gonna use this, this wire pin, this wire flag, and we're just gonna see how, how much resistance there is for us to push this into the soil. And you can put your finger on it or you could mark it um, and just to see how deep you're going. Now, so right there, is, that was really easy for me to go in. So I got about a little, maybe almost three inches on that. Let me just try it again in another spot here within this wet zone and push it in. And 
I, I didn't have to re really use much resistance to get that in and you can see I went in about five inches on that so let's let's come right over here next to it where there's where there's I don't know when the last time this was actually watered and let's just just let's just go ahead and see what the difference is would be in, a, in the same soil that doesn't have any moisture in it and you can see I'm pushing pretty hard right through there and I got that deep okay now I'm gonna really give it give it a push and see what I can get and I cannot, I, I can't get a grip any deeper than that. So you can see that's that's literally two inches I'm getting in a dry soil versus uh, almost five inches of without really a whole lot of resistance in this wet soil. And if I give it a little bit more push, about the same, you can see I got a little bit farther in the wet soil. So that that should be a pretty good indication that if you really want an accurate reading on this, you really have to make sure that you you do it when the when the soils are very wet very wet okay that, that's key so one of the things that, that we do this for is to really assess whether there's a compacted layer underneath the soil and this this wire pin will tell that if the soil is wet and you you push it down and you find that you're not able to penetrate beyond a, say a certain depth it would be worth you going into the field at that point after doing this in a couple different spots in, in the vicinity and making sure or digging down with a shovel and seeing what is actually causing that resistance is there is there a compacted layer there and this actually might also work with your other with your with your um, your ponding or your infiltration uh, test as well so you could put those two together and see if there's actually something going on there by actually digging a hole I always recommend digging a hole to see what's going on in your soil at any rate but that would be a perfect perfect justification to do so so this uh, field uh, soil field health assessment is going to deal with water stable aggregates yeah, the importance of aggregates is that they give you an indication again of, of how well the soil is doing. They, they, they'll tell you whether the soil is going to hold, uh, hold air and water well, whether it'll exchange air and water, and it gives you a lot of other indications of how perhaps plant roots will grow in it and um, just generally whether or not your soil is, is, is going to be healthy, whether you've got maybe organic matter that's, that's increasing or, or decreasing those sorts of things. There are several different methods to actually do this. What you see here in front of us is what's called the cylinder method. Uh, it, we, we chose this one because we thought in it, that in the field it would be uh, it'd be visually uh, more appealing and you'd be able to see the results better. You may not want to do this and carry out cylinders to the field every single time and if that were the case then you might be interested in this in the slake box method. This is that is a method that many of you may be familiar with particularly if you've used the soil health kits in the past. It's much more portable and uh, a lot easier to do and pretty pretty robust. There's also the strainer method. I'm not going to get into that one, but if you want to read about any of these, they're all detailed in your soil health assessment guide.